Now, this, this morning, I want to talk to you about recalibrating your church life. We talked about, in the beginning part of this, to recalibrate the first message, your relationship with God. The second message last week was how to recalibrate the mission of your life. Today, I want to talk to you about how to recalibrate your church life. Church in our culture today has become peripheral in most people's lives, most Christians. They, they think of it more in terms of, you know, when I get around to it. It's an afterthought. It really isn't a part of their everyday life in the sense that it's easily replaced with something else on their schedule. But what I want to encourage you today when we talk about your church life is my hope is to provide for you an understanding of to recalibrate. The word recalibrate means to refocus, to re-aim at something. You know, when you understand the, the, the value of your church life, when you understand what God intended it to produce, I think you're going to see how important it is, that it, it is to make it a priority in your life and as importantly, make it a priority in your kids' lives. Now, most Christians operate more like a, a thermometer than a thermostat. A thermometer just tells you the temperature of the room. You, you can get a thermometer, and, 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 if, and if you're here in the room, you know, wherever you're at, you can look, and, and, it, and the temperature is what it is. It just tells you how it feels. That's how most Christians learned how to live. They can tell you their problems. They can tell you what, what makes them upset. They can tell you what makes them happy. They basically live their life like a thermometer. But you're not called to live as a thermometer. You're called to live as a thermostat. A thermostat is connected to a source that when you move the thermostat, it changes the atmosphere of the room. Now, if you're married, you have thermostat wars in your house probably. Anybody ever have any thermostat wars? Now, a church is a perfect place to tell you thermostat wars all the time because everybody in church is typically either hot or cold. And there are people right now that are just sweating and they're like, can't you people turn the air conditioning up? And there are women that have turned blue like Smurfs and they're like, what is wrong with you people? And it's, it was, so we, this is the only part of your relationship with God where we want everybody lukewarm, okay? We want you lukewarm, not hot or cold. Jesus said the lukewarm thing wasn't good. Now, all of us have issues when it comes to the thermostat wars. Does anybody have comforter issues with your spouse in your, on your bed? Does any men here know what I mean by that? Michelle gets this comforter, right? Now, the comforter makes me sweat. It just, it's just full of, like, stuff that just makes... It's like, it feels like you're under... A, 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 like a bonfire, right? <laughs> so I, I fold it over. We have a king-size bed, and, and, and so I flip it over. And Michelle said, you, you're going you're gonna to mess up the comforter. I said, well, I'd like to sleep. <laughs> but I don't know. I think the comforter might be more important than my sleep. And then my, I don't know, maybe your wives are like this. I don't know. But Michelle wants to keep my feet in feet prison. She tucks the bed in. So when I put my feet in, they do this. And, uh, and under there, they're saying, let my people go. <laughs> so the first thing I do when I go, I flop the comforter over, and I rip up all the sheets, and I flop them over, and I just use one sheet. And I think for almost 30 years, she has done this either out loud or deep in her heart. Why do you have to do that? Everybody has maybe your comforter wars or your thermostat wars. But what I want you to learn today is that your church life is designed to be a thermostat in your life. It can change the temperature of your life. And the absence of it is critical. In fact, you need to understand this. There are only two institutions that God has stamped his eternal approval on. The first is the family and the second is the church. They should be your highest priority in your life. People who do not make their family life and their church life their top priorities in their life will never fulfill the full mission of their life. They'll never be able to recalibrate their life properly until you give credence to what God gave credence to. The reason the church and, and your family are so significant to God is those are the two primary places where the word of God should be delivered to you in your life. And when you understand that the work of the church is not about some, some organization, but it's about a place where the word of God is engrafted into your life. Because every word from God carries with it inherent power sufficient to bring to pass what it promises. The Bible refers to the word of God as a seed. And every seed has power sufficient within it to bring to pass what life it holds. 
an apple seed put into the right conditions long enough eventually will produce an apple. And that's true with the seed of the Word of God. And your church life and your family life are critically important. That's why we're called Victory Family Church. Because those are the two institutions from which God has placed his eternal approval. And that's why I really want to encourage you, sign up for the XO conference, the, the simulcast. Michelle and I are attending it for our own marriage. And I really encourage you. And, and we're doing the next series, Let's Talk About Love. And we're going to be doing that for the next three weeks. Put it in your calendar. Invest something into your relationships. Invest something into your marriage. In week three, invest something into your, we're going to talk about sex, the last week. Did I say that out loud in church? You're allowed to. You understand sex is in the Bible, right? Well, I don't think it's appropriate to talk about it in church. One of the reasons people are having trouble is because we don't talk about it in church. So we're going to deal with these things. We're going to look in the scripture. They're going to be life affirming and give you a path to be able to walk on from God's word that will make you free. The fact of it is this. Jesus is the only hope of the world. That's it. As much as, as we do pray and should pray for our government and pray for this next election, how many of you, this election cycle is kind of crazy, isn't it? Did you ever think you'd have the apprentice running for president? <laughs> I mean, really, man, it's, it's just crazy. And then you have, you know, a, a left-wing socialist on the other. It, it's crazy. It, it's just crazy. But no matter who wins, whether the person that you tr trust God for or think that would be the right person, and we want to pray for whoever's in authority, but here's the reality. The only hope of the world is Jesus, not the next election. People say, well, if this, if this election doesn't go well, then America's finished. Can I tell you the only thing that makes America finished is this, is that when Jesus is not preeminent in the people's lives of the nation. That's it. That's the only thing. Now, how does that happen? Well, the church is the body of Christ. We are members of one another, the scripture said, and we are part of him. We, he is the head. The scripture said we are the body. And if Jesus is the only hope of the world and Jesus and the church are one, then can I suggest to you the only hope for America is not government or the next election. The only hope for America is the church. I'll try that one more time. If Jesus is the only hope of the world and the church is the body, then the church, his body, is the only hope of the world. If churches do not thrive beyond their walls and be salt and light in their world, then this, this, this nation and any nation like it will go, away, go to the way of darkness. It's our job to be salt. It's our job to be light in a dark and a very darkening and darkening culture. And until you find your place in the body of Christ, until you find your place, if you're, if you're married, in your family, as, your, as the husband, as the wife, as a child, how to relate to your parents, until you magnify those things that God magnifies, you will not have the kind of life that he wants you to have. Now, I, I'm going to be really plain if I can. Is that all right? Because you know me, I'm so shy to be plain. <laughs> so often I hear people criticize church. Now, I don't mean if, if something happened that needed corrected or, I, I, you know, people, people have stuff. I get that. I don't mean that. But I rarely, and I don't go on Facebook a lot, but when I do, you, you don't have to scroll down very long before you're going to see some genius who wrote 10 things wrong with the church. Any idiot can tear something down. Did I say that aloud again? I'm sorry. Let me say it really, let me say that politely. Any idiot can tear something down. <laughs> Anybody can pick apart their spouse. Anybody can find something wrong. You want to do something amazing with your life? Go build something. Go build a human being. Go into the midst of imperfection and fight for the best. And, you know, and even people, and a lot of people have this mindset, and I know because they've been hurt in church. And there's a lot of times people come to a church of this size so they can kind of just hide. And I'm talking to you about coming out of the shadows. Why? Because your church life is critical. But I understand why. Sometimes people get hurt in church. Sometimes leaving a church is harder to get out of the church than the mafia. Because that's why people don't want to connect. They're like, look, I, I got connected in the church once and I felt like it was my time to leave. And when I did, man, they, they treated me like garbage. I'm not, I'm not putting anybody down, but here's what I want you to know. Jesus died for you, not this church. 
You stay here as long. This is where God wants you. But if you ever felt led to go to another church, and there are marvelous churches in this region. You say, we just feel like that's a church where our family belongs, where we need to serve and where we need to be served. That's where we need to be. You not only have my blessing, I would be disappointed if you didn't go. You need to follow Jesus. You don't need to get the approval of, of, of a church. Get, serve a, a, an audience of one. So you, you can come. You can become a part. And if God ever leads you to go, well, go. You don't, if you see me out in public, you don't have to go. <laughs> it's not my business where you go to church. It's my business that if you're here to help you to recalibrate your church life, to recalibrate and find your place. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. This wasn't to, to John or Mary at, at Ephesus. This is to the church. He said, consequently... He said, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people. Everyone say, I'm a fellow citizen. <laughs> then he said, and you are members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, now he's not talking about a physical building, but people, in whom the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord and in him you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit do you know that God said I will dwell in you as an individual that you as an individual are the temple of the living God that when you made Jesus the Lord of your life God said I no longer will build will dwell in man's in, in, in temples built with man's hands so when people come and they say pastor John where are all the symbols in the building now, of course, we have crosses outside of the building and a cross out by the baptistry, and, and that's wonderful, and that's meaningful. But why aren't there symbols everywhere in the building? And by the way, there are really crosses, if you'll look, all throughout the mallway. But why aren't they more prominent, Pastor John? Because God said, I will no longer live in buildings made with man's hands. I will dwell in you. I will walk in you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. You are the temple of the living God. Amen. Not a building. This is just a building. It isn't church till you come in it. It's just a building. I promise you, the people that built it were not spiritual. Some of them were, but I was in the room. I heard Jesus' name mentioned a few times. And they weren't, they weren't a worshiping him, okay? It's critically important that you understand that you are meant to be joined together. You are meant to be built together. And there is a habitation of God in the Spirit that only occurs in the context of the united and joined and growing body of Christ. And you can't do that on your own. Yeah, but we have home church. Home church is like the old cereal, grape nuts. They weren't grape and they weren't nuts. It was a ground up loaf of bread. I don't know why they called it grape nuts. How many of you ever ate grape nuts? And you pour it out, they're like little pebbles, remember? And it would hit the bowl. Brrr. Took you an hour and a half to eat them. They were like eating rocks. He said, well, I haven't heard of grape nuts. Well, you can see why that didn't stick. <laughs> Home church doesn't exist. It is as unbiblical for my pinky to say, we're going to have a pinky church and we're going to go be pinkies and pop around and have pinky church. You cannot be a church outside of the context of the body. Now, I understand sometimes people have been hurt and injured and they don't want to, be, they don't want to risk. I understand that. God understands that. But can I encourage you? You can do the same thing with your family life. You can be so hurt and so wounded through some of the things that happened in your family that you isolate yourself there too. But God wants to make you whole and he wants you to fulfill the mission of your life, not just in the context of your family, but in the context of his church. How many of you know what Lincoln Logs are? How many of you remember Lincoln Logs? How many of you played with Lincoln Logs? Lincoln Logs are notched. And how many of you ever played with normal blocks like this? They're, they're not notched at all. Just so you know, these blocks came from Pastor Matt Gate. Now they did, and they've been in this family for 40 years, and Pastor Matt threatened us that he has to get these back. Now why is that? They're, they're really like an heirloom in his family. There's a whole box of them back there, but to tell you the real truth, you don't mention he's here, but I just have to tell you, if you go in his office, sometimes he plays with blocks. <laughs> but you are notched as a human being. You are meant to be interconnected with others. And yet most people live their life with these flat blocks. 
you're notched. Let me tell you this. You may not be connected in the right context in your family. You may not be connected in the right context to your church, but I promise you, you're connected to something. I promise you, because God made you notched to be connected. It may be to something unhealthy. It may be to an addiction. It may be to the pursuit of money. It may be to be successful. It may be, it may be, it may be. But until the things God makes first, I make first, I will never live in the full purpose of God. Now, here's the danger. When something is interconnected, there's a strength to it. The Bible says a threefold, a threefold cord is not easily broken. But you get an individual strand, you can snap it, a baby can snap it. You are meant to be interconnected like this house made of Lincoln logs. This is a house that's not connected. It's made of blocks. How many of you know life sometimes has some bumps in the road? Anybody ever have any bumps in the road? Anybody here have trouble come to your life? Anybody ever step into a pile of stupid on yourself by your own choice? Anybody ever, anybody ever done stupid in their life? No, just me? Okay, when bad things happen, you are going to shake. And if you are connected and interconnected in the context of God's body, there is a strength that you will find in no other way because in life, you're going to have assaults come. And when they come, this house falls because it's, it's, just, it's not connected. It just sits there independently. This, you can bang this table forever and it's not going anywhere because it's notched. You are notched and you are designed. Listen to me. You are designed by God to be interconnected with other people. You are designed by God to be interconnected in the kingdom of God. You can either be a Lincoln log or a blockhead. <laughs> be a Lincoln log. Use some wisdom in your life because you are not designed to grow outside of the body. Listen, the body of Christ and the physical body are paralleled in the Bible. Nothing grows outside of the life of the body. You could take any part of your body, remove it from the body and put it in a dish. It stops growing and it will begin to die and suffer. And if it isn't connected soon enough, it, will, it can actually lose its life. It's so important that you understand that I understand that your, your relationship with God is recalibrating it is what we started with. Or your mission in life, recalibrating it, are directly connected to your church life. Because if your church life doesn't flourish, the other two won't as well. You know, years ago, church used to be people's at church attendance habits were very different. Today, statistically, if a person goes, goes to church on average about one and a half times a month, that's considered a person committed to the church. Let me give you some statistics here at Victory. This weekend, there'll be somewhere around 3,000 people here. But any given month, and you take any four to five week period of time, month after month after month after month, and you're going to find that, do you know how many people actually come during that five-week period? Well over 7,000 people. But on any given weekend, you might only have 3,000. Number one, I think it's supernatural. They know which week's not to come. But here's the reality, because that's the habit of most people. They have taken what the scripture said, which is that forsake not the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is. And, for, and he said, and then gather even more so when you see the day of Christ return approaching. How many of you see the day of Christ return approaching? Amen. Isn't it interesting? The two institutions under the greatest assault today are the family and the church. The, 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 the family and the church, are the, you think about it, it's the only two groups that it's still politically correct to attack. <laughs> it's the only two groups. Why? Because they're not being attacked by, by just human beings. They're being attack, attacked by a spiritual force of darkness that wants to kill and steal and destroy and hurt people. Your family life, your church life, I want you to recalibrate. The next three weeks, we're going to recalibrate our, our intimate relationships. But this week, I'm going to talk to you about recalibrating your life. I remember years ago when I was, I was, in, I was a young man, I was in college, and I was living a very, very ungodly life. I was, uh, uh, I was smoking things other than cigarettes, and I was ingesting things and not Advil, and, and I was living in a way that was very ungodly. In fact, the Bible said it's a shame to speak of those things. But I, did, I felt trapped. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't know the way out. And I'd given my life to Christ when I was a, a younger man, in my, about 16. And, but I was caught. I didn't know how to get out of the life I was living. My mother connected me to a church. And, and my pastor in that church 
We had church back then, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, three separate services. And I started, I, when I gave my life to Christ, I started to go to that church. My pastor, uh, is, he still preaches the word of God, Bill Anzavino, he still pastors the same church, is a teaching machine. He would, he would speak about an hour and 15 minutes at a minimum. And he talked so fast. If, if you really, any human, normal human would speak, it would take them two hours to use that many words. And it would just be for an hour and 15 minutes, three times a week. And I realized as I look back what, the, what he did for my life. But I am so grateful. There are times to this day that I face things and I still hear his voice saying certain things connected to God's word and it keeps me. I had more church in my life in four days than the average Christian gets in four weeks. You say, are you saying the church is important? I'm telling you it's life and death important because God set it up. God set it up for a purpose. Not so you could punch your attendance ticket, so that you could have life and life abundance brought to you. It's critically important that I look back now, my relationship with God, my mission in life, how intimately connected it was. I remember sitting in church and, and I was reading my Bible right before the service was starting and, and I didn't know my Bible from, from, any other, from a novel. And I just opened it and, and I saw where the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy and he said, my son Timothy. And I remember sitting there and guys, we were all sitting together, a bunch of young men and our family, we were just all connected and a bunch of young people serving God. And I said, guys, I didn't know Paul had a kid named Timothy. And if you don't know your Bible, he, he was talking about my son in the faith. The guy sitting in front of us turned around, and he, and he was really polite. He said, he said, John, he said, that he wasn't his son. He was his son in the faith. Oh, I said, okay. You could be here today and not, I mean, like me, not know a thing about God. But can I tell you something? Getting in the Word of God Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, in our church, you have the opportunity to be in a small group. Next week is rally day. There are already 500 plus people signed up for small groups. There are, that you can go on our, our small group finder on our website. I plead with you to get connected to a small group. Don't be a blockhead. Be a Lincoln log. You say, well, we're, we're just kind of, we're at a busy season of our life. I love that one. We're too busy for God. You're, then you're too busy. I love this one. We're too busy with our kids to put God first. Well, there you go. Now that's a, guys, listen, go to any parent my age or older and ask them this question. What would you like to do differently raising your kids? Listen to what they say and go do what they told you. Because I promise you, as you get older, you're going to look back at the things you thought were important that you put before God, that you put before putting the things of God in your church life before you, and you are going to regret it because you will teach your children to live this way as well. If you make God on the periphery, your kids will put God on the periphery. And can I tell you this? At that point, you can pray and you can seek God and God will help. And, and God will help put Humpty Dumpty back together, together again. But can I tell you something, mom and dad? Get your kids in the presence of God. Make the things of God a priority. Get in a small group. We have small groups that run throughout. All the way down through our ministries here. Now, that I, I don't see that, I, this, this term, I don't see a lot in, in our middle school and Thrive right now. But and I may be mistaken. But those are going to evolve as well. We're just a couple years into this. Get your kids involved in a small group. Don't be too busy to have a good life. Don't be so busy building a life that you don't have a life. It's an amazing thing to walk with a living God. Every, your church life is designed to facilitate what Jesus came to produce for you. The mission of Jesus was to give you freedom. He said it this way, for whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Every step toward God is a step toward freedom. He wants you free in your life. Your church life is to facilitate that freedom. Part of our small group curriculum is something called life, living in freedom every day. How many of you have gone through the 13-week life? Isn't it incredible? And it culminates with, uh, with a retreat that we do right here at the church, a Friday and a Saturday. I beg you, listen, I'm telling you, if I could get on my knees and it would, it would help, I would beg you to take life. Some of you that have already taken life, raise your hand if you've taken life, wave at me. 
Some of you waving at me right now, you need to lead life this term. So it's too late. Pastor John, would you stand up? This is John Spencer, otherwise known as Methuselah. <laughs> that, that's, I, I've been teasing John for 30 years. Listen, he married Kathy. She was, she's so much younger than him. John's like 102. But does he look good for 102? Come on. <laughs> Pastor John Spencer looks good for 102. Keep standing. Uh, raise your hand again if, you're, if, you did, if you've already gone through life. All right, see this gentleman here? It's not too late. You track him down. Tackle him. And say, Pastor John, I'm going to lead a life group this term. Because I'm telling you, some of you that raised your hand. Thanks, John. You can be seated. It's easy. There you, there you, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Take life. Put it, I'm telling you, it will change your world. It is designed to put freedom in your everyday life. Don't be too busy to make your life better. Recalibrate, re-aim. Don't put God on the periphery. Make him first. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Psalms 119 verse 9 says this. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Now listen to this. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word is the greatest agent from which to recalibrate your life. And I want to talk to you today about the power of feeding on the word of God. Feeding on God's word, listen, must have the deepest priority of our lives because through it, God supernaturally does many things in our life. In your bulletin today, I, I've given you a, a, a handout. I wrote on the back of it. The front is the, is the uh, insert about our next series, uh, Let's Talk About Love. But on the back, I've given you a list of scriptures. And I'm going to go through those, not in order, but I want you to take that home with you. And if somebody on our staff would put a link to that on the website, I want people to be able to get that on the website. God's word is a seed. You don't have one problem. I don't have one problem, one area of weakness in your life, not one area, not one area that the word of God is not powerful enough by itself, if you'll yield to it, to bring you sufficient power to be an overcomer in that area. Every word from God is a seed that if it's kept in the right conditions long enough, has power sufficient within it to bring to pass what it promises. It's supernatural. If you have a problem with A, B, C, anger, you fill in the blank, addictions, whatever. Can I tell you that what it usually is going to come down to is a word deficiency. That's why life groups facilitate putting the word in your life. Coming to church facilitates putting the word in your life. Coming to First Wednesdays facilitates putting the word in your life. Getting in a small group will put the word in your life. Getting your kids in their classes and in the youth and, and student ministries and, and in, the, in the children's ministries and all the way down, it will put the word of God in your heart. Listen, if you'll learn to have a daily habit of feeding on the word of God, I promise you it will change your life. Not in theory, not just, oh, I'm going to read my, my scripture for the day. I'm talking about a process. It's so critically important. I'm going to read you the list of things that God's word will do for you. How many of you like to have stuff done for you? How many of you love when you have a job to do and you go to go do it and someone already did it? Isn't that awesome? How about if there's like a bunch of dishes to do and, and, and you're going to do them and I, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go in the dish, do some dishes and then it hits me. We've got three kids. <laughs> and I don't get out of my chair. I just yell, hey! And whichever one answers, come here. Go in the kitchen and do the dishes. I don't want to do the I don't want to do dishes. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> do the dishes. And they did them for me. They did them for their mother. You know, Michelle will do laundry and, and all the laundry will be clean and in the baskets. And then she'll say to the kids, now there's only one at home, so she's stuck. <laughs> hey, you got some clothes to fold. It's awesome when someone does the work for you. Isn't it great? How many of you love Thanksgiving when you don't have to do the cooking? We have Thanksgiving at our house now. It's, a, it's become a tradition where, where the ethnic atrocities occur in our home at Thanksgiving. It's better when I go to one of my brother's houses 
because I just kind of get to waltz in. Michelle's done all the stuff she likes to cook, and, and I just carry it in hot. Then I just, and then I just eat. Then I go find a chair. Ha! <laughs> Thanksgiving is no fun for the people that do the cooking and, and all the work. If, if, you know, people, I love Thanksgiving. Not, not if you're doing the cooking, you don't. Let me read to you what God's Word will do for you. And your church life, listen to me, dear one, listen. Your church life, if, you, if this isn't significant in your life, all the things I'm about to read to you are going to be muted in your life. Number one, here's what God's Word will do with you, for you, if you'll let it work in your life. It will wash you and make you holy. Ephesians 5 says, it will make you holy and, and cleanse you through the washing of the water through the Word of God. How many of you know life, you have some Velcro and, and life sticks to you. God's Word will wash you cleansed. Do you know the Word of God will feed you? 1 Peter 2 said, like a newborn babe, you can crave or, or pure spiritual milk that you may grow up in it in your salvation. It's a feeding source. Do you know God's Word will give you direction? Psalm says it's a light. It's a, the Word of God is a lamp to your feet. It is a light to your path. Oh, do we live in a darkening world. But if you put the Word of God in your life in, on a daily basis, if you have a church life where you're hearing the Word of God, where you're coming together, where the wisdom of God, the power of God, the grace of God is coming together in this context, if you aren't getting this on a continuum, you are missing God, you are failing to receive the fullness of what He has for you. I want to recalibrate today your church life. Do you know the Word of God will prevail for you? How many of you like to prevail in life? How many of you like to be an overcomer? Listen to what the Bible says in Acts 19. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. You want to prevail in an area of your life? Get God's Word in that area of your life, and the Word will produce a prevailing atmosphere in your heart and in your life. The Word of God, it said, will sanctify you and set you apart. It will lift you out of the filth of this world. It will sanctify you or cleanse you, pulling you out of a culture. Most people live their life set on fire of a course of hell in a culture. And the culture defines their marriage and the culture defines their kids and the culture defines everything they do. When God said, I don't want you to be a, link, a blockhead. I want you to be a Lincoln Log. I want you to be interconnected, not just with him, but with others in the body. But, but can I, let me just take a side journey, just a little one, where dear people will say things like this, I love Jesus, I just hate the church. That's like looking at your wife and saying, baby, I love you, I just hate your body. Yeah, that didn't go over well, did it? <laughs> let me say it this way, week three of the series ain't never happening for you. <laughs> Do you know the church is called the bride of Christ? Do you know that when you make... When you make disparaging remarks about the church, you're talking about the bride of Christ. You're looking at Jesus and say, Lord, I love you. I just hate your bride. I love you. I just hate your body. Be very careful how you talk about things that Jesus died for. Be very careful. Doesn't mean there aren't things that, that need to be fixed and things that need to be better. Because there are people in church, and as long as you have people, it's imperfect. I mean, that, that, I understand that. It doesn't mean you don't make it better. It's just you just don't get to sit back and shoot at stuff and say, well, I don't, I don't like that, and bam, bam, bam. And, you and as a result, you never live like the Lincoln Log. You're connected to something, but not to the things of God. You live like a blockhead. And hurt and all of this nonsense can cause you to live an independent life, not just in the kingdom, but in the family life as well. And I tell you, you don't have to live that way. I understand there may be reasons why you do. You may be so hurt today, and God wants to help you with that hurt but you aren't made to live that way. And you'll never live the full life you're meant to live until you change the way you see these things. The Bible says it will grow you up. 1 Peter 2, 2 again tells you that you will grow by the Word of God. Do you know that the Word of God is your weapon? Ephesians says that you take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God's Word in your life is like a, a two-edged sword into the enemies of your life. It cuts going in and it cuts going out. Do you know it says it will save your polluted mind? James told us that if you'll receive the engrafted word into your life, it is able or possesses the ability to save your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. We are in epidemic positions in this, in, in this world that we live where our soulless realms are under attack. 
so much filth and garbage tries to surround our thought life. Have you ever been so vexed in your mind where you just don't know how you're going to get to the next day? I hope you haven't, but very few of us get through life without having our soulish realm so overwhelmed through an event or through something that happened or maybe an ongoing process in your life that you're just vexed and you don't know what to do. The Bible says that if you'll receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, it will save you. It will restore your soul. Do you know how many people's soulless realms have been tortured before they ever were an adult? And God's word says, if you'll let my word in your heart, if you'll be engrafted into my body, if you'll be a Lincoln log and let my word get in you, if you'll, you'll connect with other believers, facilitate it through things like small groups, coming to church, go on and on and on. You're daily putting the word in your heart. My word will move into those broken places and I will restore your soul. I will make new, I will heal what life has torn down. It's an amazing thing to walk with a God that loves you. The Bible says the word of God will heal you and deliver you. Psalms 107, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destructions. How many of you are thankful for God that he wants to heal you and deliver you? God's word produces that for you. Do you know it brings faith to you? I bet, I don't know, two, three hundred times in my life, people have come to me and say, Pastor John, pray for me that I'll have faith. And I always say the same thing. I can't. It's unscriptural to pray that God will give you faith. Faith doesn't come through prayer. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17 says, and by hearing that comes by the word of God. Faith toward God is attached to engrafting the word of God in your heart. Do you know that God's word is your hope? In Psalms 119, he said, I hope in your word. This is a world that, I mean, it's, it's like a, a giant sucking sound, sucking the hope out of your life. And if you'll learn to live in a continuum of putting the word in your heart with a daily practice, being connected like a Lincoln log to the kingdom of God, making church a priority, not a legalistic priority, but, but life, putting God first, he'll become your hope. It's your daily bread. Jesus said it, it, that man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's the word of God that caused you to be born again. First Peter says, you've been born again, not of a parable, perishable seed, but an imperishable one through the word of God that lives and endures forever. Even coming to Jesus was accomplished through the living word of God. And then lastly, he said, the word of God will build you up and give you an inheritance. When Paul was leaving those ministry leaders in Ephesus from Miletus, he said this to them. He said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. How many of you remember Hans and Franz? I've come to... Bump you, oh, come on. I've come to bump you up, right? My job as a pastor is to build you up. But I, if I were, and what I'm going to pray today as we close here in a moment, I commend you to God and to the power of his word, the word of his grace, which is, which is able, the word is able to build you up. Now listen to this last one. And give you an inheritance among the saints. If I told you today that a billionaire had passed away and the, and the will was to be read this morning, and here's what it said, those who showed up at the Sunday service at Victory on this date are in my will. I'm dispersing a billion dollars. You're in the inheritance. How many of you are going to go, we're going to be late for lunch? <laughs> How many of you are sticking around till you get your stuff? Because you believe in the inheritance of a dead guy. Would you know there's an inheritance from another dead guy who didn't stay dead but rose from the dead? and said, I give you an inheritance through my word. And when you put the word of God in you, it builds you up and it gives you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. Amen. Let me lastly say this. I want to challenge you to a one-year challenge that every day of your life for one year, I promise you, if you'll do what I'm about to say to you, I promise you, you will not recognize your life in one year. You, things you never thought would change, things you never thought about yourself that could get better or change or, or situations or circumstances, your life will be unrecognizable to you in 12 months. If you will make a habit, a daily habit of putting God's word in your life, reading the word of God, getting podcasts. How many of you have a smartphone? Well, then be smart and use it. Get the podcast thing and put people, every day of the world, uh, Pastor Willie George, a church on the move, talks to me. 
Chris Hodges from Church of the Highlands talks to me. Robert Morris talks to me. Andy Stanley talks to me once a month on his leadership podcast. It's like 15 minutes long. Wish he could give us a little bit more, but thanks for it once a month, Andy. But I'll take it. I mean, you can get full of the Word of God. Do it on a daily basis. Number two, come to church every weekend and first Wednesday. Make it a priority. I don't mean legalistically punch your ticket. If you're on vacation, go on vacation. I'm talking about make it putting God the first part of your week. Go through growth track if you haven't done it yet. Stop putting it off. Go through it. It's a beginning stage. It's the beginning of you learning how to live a growing spiritual life. Get in a small group or lead one. Do it now. Do it now. It's, now's the time to do it. Then lastly, serve somewhere bigger than yourself. Well, I have too many problems. I can't help anybody yet. Can I tell you this? Don't buy that lie. You need to serve people now while you're in trouble. Because the Bible said when you water others, you will water yourself. And I promise you, I promise you, in 12 months, your life will be unrecognizable because the power of the Word of God will change things that you will not be able to change for generations. And your children's children's children will thank you. Let's pray together. Father, I pray over every person here under the sound of my voice that we would commit to the power of your word. I speak life over your people. I thank you, Father, as Paul prayed. I commend them to you, my Father, into the word of your grace that you are able to build them up and give them an inheritance among those which are sanctified. Lord, I speak your blessing over your people, those that are discouraged or maybe broken or hurting, that they would never let those things define them, but begin to feed on the word of God, which will make them free. For the truth will make them free. The truth will make them free. Lord, I pray freedom over your people. I pray help in every area where they're hurting and wounded. I pray that this is a church where we are armed and linked together, not to fight through one another, not to put one another down, but to build one another up. That this is a place where we are not here to see through people, but to see them through. Let this be a come-as-you-are place where you can come receive love, mercy, and grace, and grow into the strength and power that's in Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you. His heads remain bowed and eyes closed. If you're here this, this morning and you don't know Jesus as the Lord of your life, and you don't know what would happen to you if you drew, drew your final breath today, there really is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. With every head bowed and every eye closed, say, Pastor, I want to receive Jesus into my heart today. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. I'll pray for you right where you're seated. The whole church will pray it together with you. Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, you say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. Right where you're seated, I'll pray for you. Would you lift your hand right now? Do it right now and I'll pray for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. You've not yet raised your hand. Say, Pastor, include me with those many that have. I can see you're not going to embarrass anybody. Just pray for me as well to make Jesus my Savior. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. One last moment. Raise your hand so I can see it if you haven't yet done so. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Now listen, if you raised your hand or you should have, pray this out loud. Jesus will come into your heart. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. And you come back next week. You keep coming to church and let God do something great in your life. And if you say, I don't live around here, we'll help you find a church. We want you to, be, to go to your next steps in God. Let me pray for you. If you raised your hand or should have, pray this out loud, and the whole church will pray it out loud together with you. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear the debt of my sin. I open the door of my heart and the door of my life and Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now to be my Savior and to be my Lord. Thank you for coming. I am now your child. My sin is washed away. I am heaven bound. And I confess boldly that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen. Give them a hand, would you?